Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I don't want to try to get you to obey God so you have more money, more prosperity, more favor, bigger house. I want you to obey God because you love Jesus. Today I want to talk to you about breaking Satan's assignment. Amen. And we're all excited about that. Well, you know, the devil does have a plan for your life in John 10:10. 10, 10, the Bible says, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. So his assignment is to kill, steal, and destroy. Not just to kill you physically, but to kill everything good in your life. To kill your joy, to kill your peace, to steal your peace, to make you miserable. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have and enjoy your life. I think learning how to enjoy every moment of your life is one of the greatest ways in the world to get the devil back for all the mean things he's done to you. I never enjoyed my life very much. I grew up in an abusive home, and I can actually remember getting in trouble for laughing. My father was a very somber, mean, harsh man, and there just was no joy in our home. And I was probably in my 40s until I realized what a major part of my life was missing and that God didn't want us just to go through life, but he wants us to enjoy life. And he wants us to enjoy where we're at on the way to where we're going. He wants us to enjoy every moment of our lives. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. So Satan wants to take our joy because if he can get our joy, he can get our strength. And if he can get our strength, then it's easier for him to deceive us. So. The devil has a plan for your life, but thank God, God also has a plan for your life. Now, James 4, 7 says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. You know, that is just so simple. So simple. Do what God tells you to and the devil won't have any authority over your life. But we like to do what we want to do, do what we think, what we feel, hope God will bless it, and then spend our life frustrated, being angry at the devil because nothing's working out in our life. Submit yourself to God. It's not going to do any of us any good to try to resist the devil if we have not submitted ourselves to God. The power to resist is in submitting. <laughs> do you hear me? It's pointless to try to resist the devil if you have known areas of disobedience in your life that you're making excuses for. Now, I can tell you that I probably have areas in my life that are not pleasing to God, but he hasn't made me aware of them yet. We all have areas like that. I'm sure glad that God doesn't show us everything that's wrong with us all at once, aren't you? He knows how much we can take and when, and he works with us on something and works with us on something, and then he'll let us rest a little while, and then show us something else. I can say, and I don't say this in any kind of a bragging way at all, but I can honestly say that I don't have any known disobedience in my life. That doesn't mean that there's not any, but I'm not consciously aware of any. And whatever God shows me, I want to do my very best to get in line with Him simply because I have learned, and it was a long, hard journey, and I did it wrong a long time. I went through all the stuff I'm talking about, my will, what I thought, what I wanted, my feelings, my emotions, rebuking the devil all the time, frustrated because I felt like the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. 
And I used to regularly quote one half of James 4, 7, and I've heard people do that as long as I've been a Christian. People have a tendency to only quote the second half of James 4, 7. Resist the devil and he must flee. But that's not what it says. It says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he must flee. I want you to get even a deeper attitude than what you already have of being promptly and radically and extremely obedient to God. I talked to you about putting my grocery cart away and you've heard all those little stories how God taught me the importance of just being an excellent person and not to leave messes for other people. Well, you know, this was back in the 70s when God began to teach me about putting that silly little grocery cart back in the space marked off for grocery carts. And it took me two years, two years to get obedient to just do that. So I just want you to understand that I've done it wrong. And I wasted a lot of time screaming at the devil, wondering why things weren't working out for me. Why don't we have more prosperity? And why don't this? And why isn't my ministry growing? And why God, why? And when God, when? Just rebuking the devil all the time. And finally I found out if you just do what God tells you to. <laughs> Come on, this isn't hard today. When I said we're going to preach on breaking Satan's assignment last night and this morning, everybody just clapped and cheered. But I knew when I told you how you break Satan's assignment that the clapping would stop. <laughs> it's really interesting to be up here and watch people. The things they get excited about and the things they... We're always wanting something easy, some new magic formula. <laughs> but the Bible's been the same ever since it was written. Do what God tells you to, you'll be blessed. Do what you feel like doing. Your life's going to be a mess. We're talking this weekend about discipline and self-control. If you missed the other three messages, you missed a lot, but thank God you can get it on CD or wait for it to come on TV. Discipline and self-control is vitally necessary to live an obedient lifestyle. Because to be obedient, you cannot do what you feel like doing all the time. Every day of my life, I have to discipline myself. Every day of my life, I have to discipline myself. Every time I sit down to eat, I have to discipline myself. Every time somebody aggravates me, I have to discipline my thoughts and my words. I've not come to the point where I'm so sweet. And neither of you, you know why? Sin is not dead. Romans 6, however, says we are dead to sin. That means the renewed, the born-again part of us, our renewed, regenerated spirit does not want anything to do with sin. That part of us is dead to sin. But in our soulish being, in our flesh, there's a work going on. Now, I'm much quicker to say yes now I hope and pray I never argue again with God for two years trying to get out of something silly like putting a grocery cart back. <laughs> and I think you have to come to a point where you just, you see the value of what I'm talking about. And you realize that if, you, if you're not obedient to God, there are consequences. And I know that we're in the dispensation of grace. And God forgives us, and I'm so glad that He does. But you're going to find out today, too, that, that obedience is directly connected to how much we love Jesus. I don't want to try to get you to obey God so you have more money, more prosperity, more favor, bigger house. 
I want you to obey God because you love Jesus. Because you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Because more than anything in your whole life, you want to be what God wants you to be. I don't know about you, but I, you know, I, I just, and I know this is ridiculous, but I feel sorry for God. I know He doesn't need my pity, but I'm always going around, oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for the way people act. I'm so sorry that so many people in the world don't want anything to do with you. And that they connect your name to cuss words and all the terrible, God, I'm so sorry for all the murder and the crime and the terrible things, the wars that go on. But the Bible says that we're to be lights shining out in a dark place. And I want to be somebody that God can be proud of. Don't you want to be somebody that He can look at you and not have to look at all the mess that's going on? Well, can I just get it clear here from the beginning that if you want to be obedient, it's going to cost you. If I want to be obedient, and I do, it has cost me. And it will continue to cost me. You say, well, what's it going to cost me? You're not going to get your way all the time. Everything's not going to feel good. Everything's not going to be comfortable. Everything's not going to make you laugh. It will ultimately. But you know, we all like to get our way. There's not anybody that doesn't want to get their way. I want to get my way. But I had to find out that that's not reality. And we have to believe. And I said this in one of the other meetings, but I know we have a lot of new people here today. We must believe that anything that God tells us to do, He's telling us to do it or not to do it for our benefit. And if you can believe that, that no matter how much you want something, let's just say that you're a single woman and you've been single for a long time and you've had this good looking guy come along now and man, he seems interested in you, and, but he's not a believer. And you've also noticed a few other little problems. <laughs> but you want him so bad, you're starting to think, oh, I can change him. <laughs> now, God's dealing with you. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But God, I'm so lonely. I can't stand to be lonely anymore. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> now, God's not telling you that because he doesn't want you to have anybody. He's not telling you that because He delights in watching you cry yourself to sleep at night because you're lonely. He's telling you that because He's trying to save you a lifetime of agony and misery and pain. And if you wait on God, if you wait on God, He'll bring the right person along at the right time and it'll bring joy in your life. And you can apply this in thousands and thousands of different ways. Now, let me ask you some hard questions about discipline. We're going to just look at a lot of different areas here this morning. And see how it goes. How disciplined are you with your mouth? Do you talk too much? Or maybe you don't communicate enough. Maybe you're just not a good communicator. This morning we were back in our little room waiting for the meeting to start and I was trying to get my microphone on and Dave always helps me because we got to string it down the back of my clothes and I need his help. Well, I couldn't find him. He wasn't there. He didn't tell me where he went. Dave is very good about disappearing. He just goes. Now, see, I'm a communicator, so I wouldn't do that. I'd tell him where I was going. But he doesn't think about it. He just decides to go, so he goes. So then I got to waste my time trying to find out where he's at to try to find somebody else to help me. So I talk too much sometimes, and sometimes he don't talk enough. Either one can be an issue. 
If you're not a good communicator, then you need to practice communicating better. And I'm just teasing Dave, he's great. But he didn't tell me where he was going this morning. <laughs> when we're out shopping together, it's ridiculous. I spend all my time looking for him. <laughs> and you can't deny it, you know that's true. We'll be in a store and all of a sudden I turn around and he, he's gone. I have no idea where he's at. And then I call him and he don't answer his phone. <laughs> he's got that on silent, so. Isn't Dave wonderful to let me pick on him like I do? How many of you saw the TV program last week where we had the safety deposit box key? Well, if you didn't see it, you'll have to catch it some other time, but I better behave or he'll come up here and straighten me out. What kind of voice tones do you use? I, you know, I always had a tendency to be kind of harsh in the way I came across. That was the way I was raised. I was raised by a, a harsh, hard-hearted man. And you know, sometimes it's not what you say, it's the way you say it. Amen? Let's look at Isaiah 58, verse 9. Now, we're going to talk about breaking Satan's assignment. You can discipline your mouth and break Satan's assignment. Did you know that? Isaiah 58, 9 says, Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away from your midst yokes of oppression wherever you find them, the finger pointed in scorn toward the oppressed or the godly, and every form of false, harsh, unjust, and wicked speaking. So this is telling me that if I want my prayers to get answered really quick, then I need to do something about my mouth. I can't just say the right thing in prayer. I can't just say the right thing in worship. I can't have a mixture in my life where I sound spiritual to my spiritual friends and then I go home and once I shut the door on my house, I'm like a nightmare for everybody else to live with. Come on now, let's get real. I used to say I could get along with everybody until somebody came home. <laughs> well, it takes discipline. And, and the mouth, no doubt, is the most difficult area. Of all the areas, it's the most difficult to control. And the Bible actually tells us that no man can tame the tongue. That's why I've been trying to tell you in every session, when I talk to you about discipline and self-control, and even obedience, this is not just something where I want you to go home now and try to use your willpower to be a better person. What I'd like you to do is go home, spend special time with God, and say, God, I want to be everything you want me to be, but I cannot do it if you don't do it through me. You have to do it through me. You can spend a little less time trying and more time waiting on God and get a lot better benefit. Did you hear me? Oh God, I'm trying. I'm trying, God. I'm trying. I'm trying. But do you spend time with God every day before you go out and try to do anything else? And you know, I don't even know it so much about the time. Everybody thinks they don't have time. Well, you know, God understands your situation. If you're a young mother and you've got five little kids and you're trying to get them out of the door, then you may not be able to spend two hours with God every morning like somebody else, but you can, you can do a minute. I mean, you can lock yourself in the bathroom and you can do a minute. You can do two minutes, you can do five minutes. Do what you can do and stop complaining about what you can't do. Amen? And I think if you start where you're at, then that desire to spend time with God is going to grow and grow, and it's not going to be a big work strip for you. I'm going to say this as long as I'm preaching. There's no hope of victory if you don't spend personal, private, quality time in the presence of God. Not just reading, not just telling God your list of everything you have to have today to stay saved but just waiting on him and saying, God, I'm nothing without you. I cannot do anything without you. Every day I say to God, God, if you do not help me 
keep my mouth shut, I will get in trouble with it today. I mean, I admit it, I got a big mouth. It works for this. <laughs> but you know, for example, I had to learn that God's called me to be your teacher, but I'm not my husband's teacher. So I got to know how to turn it off and turn it on. I have to come from teaching you to humbly letting him teach me. I'm better, but I'm not totally there yet. Thank you. Oh, th thank you. I think. And my gosh, how many years has it taken me, and still I'm not totally there, to be able to discipline my mouth when he wants to correct me about something and I say, well, yeah, you got some problems too, buddy. <laughs> Come on, anybody say, I'm a witness? The Bible says only a fool hates correction. So we need to do something about disciplining the words of our mouth. Do you complain? You don't know? You can't decide? What? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Satan will mess around in your circumstances and try his level best to find things that irritate you just to get you to lose your focus so you start finding something ridiculous to complain about. Now, I think that we have to get a revelation about complaining. We have to realize that when we complain, we open a door for the devil. And not only that, when we complain about our circumstances, we remain in them. Complain means I remain. Praise means I get raised. <laughs> so we can complain and remain, or we can praise and be raised, whichever we want it to be. I'd like you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're talking about breaking Satan's assignment. You could just stop complaining and get the devil off your back. Verse 8, we must not gratify evil desire and indulge in immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 suddenly fell dead in a single day. Let me just say that there are consequences to disobedience. Now, I'm not telling you you're going to fall over dead if you disobey God. Although Ananias and Sapphira did, I'm glad we're getting a little more mercy. But when we don't obey God, any area of my life or your life or anybody watching by TV, any area where we have known disobedience that we're making excuses for it, which is what we always do. We always make excuses for it. And it would, we would say to somebody else, I cannot believe you do that. But for us, there's always a reason why. <laughs> well, I know I should, but. Well, I know I shouldn't, but let me tell you all the reasons why it's okay for me not to obey God. And there's consequences to that. We don't fall over dead, but we have death in our circumstances, and we get death in our soul. We're depressed, discouraged, disgruntled, unhappy, no joy, no peace, nothing satisfies us. You know a grouchy, complaining person is not going to be satisfied no matter what you give them. In Philippians 4, 6, the Bible says, Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Maybe you're asking God for something right now, and His answer to you would be, Why should I give you that? You're still complaining about the rest of what I've given you. Come on, I'm smiling real big today. I'm going to leave Hampton, Virginia, smiling so big at you that you can't possibly be mad at me.
Well, Satan is determined to destroy you, but you can break his assignment and gain victory in your life by disciplining yourself to spend personal, quality, quiet time in the presence of God. And another thing that's really wise is to make a decision to just be good to people everywhere that you go. It's amazing how it just really unnerves the enemy when you put your trust in God, you're obedient to Him, and you just make a decision to go be a blessing to people.